we've got um, the ability to record these sessions and we, we do that pretty much every week so if ever you miss a session you can usually find on the website um, details of previous sessions and you'll be able to have a look at uh, the videos and the slides from stuff we've done in the past now this week we've got um, what I think will be a really interesting session for many people where we've got um, Massimo and Salvatore have offered to do um, a presentation about highly available biz talk running on Azure IaaS. And some of you might have seen a, a blog series that the guys um, kind of did a few months ago where they talked about some of the things they've been doing and, and this, this kind of um, proof of concept they ran. So they're going to share some of the details of that, some of their insights of the experience of trying to set that up. Um, before I hand over to the guys, just really a quick one. Um, so for anybody who's new, the Integration Monday is something we do every Monday night where we've got a webcast like today about um, an integration-based topic running on Microsoft technologies. So I'm just going to drag in the website and um, just show you we've, we've got an events page on here so you'll be able to see some of the upcoming events. And those feed from Eventbrite, so we'll be adding the other ones um, in the next few days or so. But we've got events lined up for perhaps, um, through to the middle of August now. So if, if you like tonight's session, check out um, there for more information about what's coming. Um, for engaging with each other around the um, event, so we've got the Twitter hashtag Integration Monday. Again, we've also got the Integration Monday, uh, sorry, the Integration User Group website. So on here for tonight, you'll see um, in the discussion area, I've posted the link earlier, but if anyone's got any questions, we can... Um, pop them in this discussion thread here so we can chat about them now and the guys will go over the, the questions at the end but also there's the ability for them to question away and put an answer there later on um, we're also welcome to pop some questions in the chat window um, for now I'm going to pass over to the guys and let them share with the, their experience of this talk on as Thanks Hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. So hi, good evening uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Massimo Crippa and uh, I'm here with Salvatore Pelliteri. This evening we are uh, talking about a uh, high available bespoke uh, infrastructure on Azure uh, Infrastructure as a Service. But uh, first, uh, a small introduction about uh, ourselves. Good evening. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Salvatore. Good evening, everyone. I'm Salvatore Pelliteri. Just a few words about myself. I'm Italian, MVP application integration for about one year, so very little. I'm team manager and developer integration architect uh, at Microsys for more than 15 years. I deal with uh, integration projects uh, using Bitstock and uh, SQL Server SSIS, and business intelligence and data platform projects uh, using SQL Server platform. Okay, now I will give the mic to Massimo for his introduction. Okay, hear me back. I'm Massimo Crippa, and uh, I'm working as the integration architect at Codit where uh, I'm normally busy designing and implementing uh, stuff with Bistock. Within Codit, I'm also responsible for the API management competence centers, which means uh, to demonstrate uh, to the customer product like um, Azure API management or uh, and uh, Sentinet by Nivatech, and uh, all the way to the final implementation with this uh, wonderful and nice product. I'm Italian, and uh, I worked with Salvatore for, uh, for 10 years. Then uh, I got charmed by Codit, uh, and uh, you know, I, I moved to Belgium, where uh, I'm currently living. Um, recently, me and uh, Salvatore, we found, uh, um, let's say, some common inter interest around uh, this topic, and that's why we ended uh, tonight to have this, uh, this session together. Here you can find uh, our uh, Twitter account and uh, the blog's uh, references. Okay, here the, the outline uh, of the session this evening. 
So first, uh, I will give uh, a quick introduction about uh, high availability. Uh, then a uh, few words uh, about the scenario that uh, we identified in, um, in our labs. Then Salvatore will explain uh, the procedure to implement uh, the high availability, uh, sorry, the high available infrastructure on Azure. Uh, and uh, he will explain all of the procedure. This is the main uh, goal of the purpose of this session. And then he will give uh, a demo. After that, it will be my, my time again, uh, the time for uh, some tests and, uh, and the conclusions. Okay, let me talk about something uh, important here. Uh, to not create false expectation, we want to make it clear since the, yeah, since, since the beginning that this talk, uh, when you use this talk with a SQL failover cluster on Azure infrastructure as a service, this configuration is not supported by Microsoft for production environments. So what we are, uh, we are going to show is something that is good uh, for uh, test environment, is good for uh, develop an, uh, development environment, but guys, uh, when it's a matter of production, there is no try, okay? So uh, the, scope, uh, it's, uh, the scope of our exercise was to set it up, identify, identify uh, let me say, uh, potential weaknesses, uh, and perform few tests. Okay? Good. So high availability. Uh, we know that is uh, one of the main priority for many enterprises. So regardless the, the company size, from the, uh, from the big to small enterprises, when we have mission, mission critical application like database application, like communication application, integration application, all these applications need to reside on systems that are uh, designed for uh, um, high availability. Do you have some problem with the microphone? Let me, can you check Sabatore, please, the chat? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here, uh, what does uh, high availability mean? I put here uh, uh, a definition. Okay, so high availability is a system design approach uh, that ensures uh, a prearranged level of operational performance uh, that will be, let's say, met uh, during uh, a specific period. To achieve that, uh, so in order to have uh, all of the components of uh, um, our infrastructure that are 100% operational, we need the redundant machine, we need the redundant network components, and we need that all the software components must be spread over the machines. But then let me say that 100% operational is not possible, of course, and it's extremely costly to reach a number of nines that is close to 100%. So the aim, our aim generally is to minimize the time that your service is down or unavailable. Uh, here I put the very famous uh, table of nines because the HA is uh, often measured in uh, the percentage of uh, uptime uh, per year. Here, uh, looking at this uh, table, uh, we can see the very famous but uh, difficult to achieve uh, standard for uh, HA that is known as uh, five nines that it has uh, um, a downtime per year of five minutes point uh, uh, 25, okay? And for example, if you compare uh, this, um, this downtime per year to Azure Infrastructure as a Service, uh, over there uh, on Azure, we have a 99.95 when we have uh, multiple machines uh, in the same uh, availability set. And in the case of Azure, this means uh, between four and five hours uh, per uh, year. Um, last uh, things that uh, I, I want to say here is about the, the importance of the continuous monitoring about the status of our environment. Because of course, more components we, we add to our uh, infrastructure means more uh, resilience, but it also means uh, more complexity, it also means more uh, risk. So it's definitely crucial to monitor something like, uh, to have a, a complete monitor, like uh, check the log files, verify backups, uh, analyze system metrics, uh, and so on. All of kind of tasks that a lot of time 
are demanded to, to manage service, for example. Let me, okay, like this. Then we saw, uh, then why, why we need the high availability. First, to ensure the data availability. So if our business, uh, our business today, for example, uh, require data solution that are always available 24 hours per day, 24 seven, of course, and uh, sure things that if uh, we want to connect to our bank account and we want to access to our data, a service unavailable, uh, it's something that is not acceptable anymore. Then, uh, um, uh, to protect uh, against hardware and, uh, and software failures, okay? Uh, nowadays, the, the time window when our uh, system, our services can be restricted in order to perform maintenance, uh, all of these, uh, these time windows are shrinking and uh, let's say for more and more enterprises, for more and more customers, there is no uh, any more uh, the luxury of a scheduled downtime. So the, the, um, the cost of downtime is, uh, is rising and uh, generally uh, speaking, service interruptions are uh, costly affairs. Um, then the cost of hardware, of course, the cost of hardware is, uh, is decreasing. Independent, independently, sorry, of uh, where you, you want to host your solution, okay? The cost of high availability is decreasing. So uh, HA is, um, is becoming more affordable also for small business. If, um, if you compare, for example, the cost of, uh, of a sun years ago and nowadays, uh, definitely there, uh, we, we notice, uh, everybody notice a huge decrease of the cost. So these things, uh, for example, make, uh, make made uh, the HA more affordable. Of course, here I put, if you are not aiming to the five nines, uh, that uh, it's uh, definitely super uh, costly. Then where? Okay. Classical and very old fashioned scenario is the physical, which means uh, hardware on premise. Uh, uh, on premise, it means uh, high performances. Uh, it requires complex capacity planning, long time for provisioning. It's hard to scale. And again, uh, it's, um, it's complex uh, to monitor. Then uh, we, we have uh, the virtual uh, uh, scenario, okay? This is more simple because the provisioning is uh, simple to install. It's more scalable. It's uh, also mm, talking about monitoring. Uh, it's uh, easier to monitor because uh, um, the monitoring is limited to the operating system. Um, also, if there is uh, a part uh, um, of the, I mean, a part to, in, in order to monitor our virtualized uh, infrastructure. Then uh, we have uh, the cloud, okay? Over there, uh, we don't have the same performances uh, as on-prem, but uh, it's simple to provision. It's easier to monitor. It's definitely super easy to scale. And for example, with a matter of click, uh, we can provision our uh, virtual server farms uh, and scale it out when necessary. Uh, over there in the cloud, uh, what about the monitoring, for example? Uh, the maintenance of uh, the virtualization infrastructure is uh, completely demanded to Microsoft. Uh, sorry, not completely, except uh, uh, for the patches. That is up to us. And uh, the monitoring is, uh, for, uh, from our point of view, it's limited to the operating system. Um, in the cloud, what about the compatibility? Over there, we can, uh, we can activate almost any services on our machine. So uh, we can say that uh, Azure Infrastructure as a Service uh, um, combine the convenience of the cloud and uh, the needs uh, for control and compliance of the server. Um, again, uh, for Azure, the, the cost reduction is still the, the driving force uh, to move uh, to the cloud, uh, to extend uh, our infrastructure to the cloud. But besides the cost, uh, also flexibility, as we said, scalability and also affordability are uh, uh, the key benefits uh, um, of the Microsoft offer. 
So to recap, uh, the cloud is very convenient uh, and uh, it reduces uh, reduce the time uh, uh, to productivity. So we switch uh, now to the scenario of uh, our labs. Okay, we, we identified two scenarios. The first uh, involves uh, a single cluster where uh, we have uh, a SQL server and a BSOC server on, uh, on the same, uh, in the same uh, cluster. Huh? The first scenario is uh, definitely uh, easier to implement, especially because uh, once we solve the, the problem with the, with the storage, it, uh, it requires uh, only a little configuration on the network layer, right? Uh, we all know that this is not a good solution, having a BSTALK uh, and the SQL uh, server to compete for the same uh, system resources. So the second scenario, the one that you can find on the right, uh, is the one that we are going to see tonight. The second scenario consists uh, in, a, in a cluster uh, where we are running uh, SQL and the uh, enterprise in Gossagnon, as usual, and uh, the two additional uh, BSTALK uh, servers. This is uh, the classic, uh, again, the classic uh, high level infrastructure where we can um, extend the BSOC layer horizontally and the SQL is based on, uh, on the pillover cluster. Last things, last slide before moving uh, to the procedure and pass uh, the, the, the control uh, to Salvatore is, uh, is about uh, the, the culprit, uh, okay? So in the first slide we saw that uh, what we are going, uh, that this, uh, this uh, setup is not supported uh, uh, by Microsoft, but why? We would will, we will like to put here in this slide who is the culprit. So in the case of Azure Infrastructure as a Service, at this moment, Microsoft uh, for Azure, it doesn't provide any storage option that allow to build a failover cluster. So that's the answer for, uh, for Azure. But then why not, uh, why we cannot use the always on availability group? Uh, over there uh, is because uh, of uh, the MSDTC. This is the, the MSDT, MSDTC, sorry guys, uh, is uh, the blocking problem over there. Because for example, when, uh, after a failover, when we move uh, uh, to the new primary replica, the primary replica contacts the DTC and then uh, the DTC doesn't uh, um, recognize anymore uh, the, new, the new replica, the new primary replica, and uh, it will uh, abort all the, trans all the transactions that are, uh, let's say, marked as uh, ready to commit it, and then uh, it's possible to have, um, let's say, inconsistencies between uh, this of database. So, the, this is, those are the two culprits in the case of a classic uh, SQL failover cluster and uh, with uh, always on availability group. Good. Uh, I finish with my quick introduction and then I will pass uh, uh, the mix to Salvatore and he will show us, he will, he will walk us uh, through the, the procedure. Okay? Salvatore, your time. Okay. Thank you, Massimo, for your introduction. Now let's see the procedure in the most interesting aspects. Uh, okay, I said that you cannot see every little detail of the procedure in a hour, and probably I think is not even what you want to see. So me and Massimo, we selected those we think is the most interesting phases. On this slide, you can see the main steps that make up the process of creating the file. First of all, you have to prepare the network configuration, uh, subnets, availability sets, and then the domain controllers. SQL Server. SQL Server, or more in general, the cluster that will host not only the SQL service, but also the distributed transaction coordinator and enterprise single sign-on service is the most complex and critical area to configure. So we will see the cluster preparation steps, data keeper setup and configuration, SQL server setup, distributed transaction coordinator cluster configuration, and then uh, client access setup, uh, which will allow access to the cluster services by the bespoke server services. Finally, 
we will see the configuration of Enterprise Single Sign-On Service and then bestow servers. Subnets. If you want to implement a server farm on Microsoft Azure to ensure that virtual machines can communicate with each other, first of all, you must define and configure a virtual network. Uh, not, not much to say about the subnets, except that you must pay attention to the address space chosen, considering possible interactions with on-premises networks, static IP addresses, and uh, virtual machines with multiple NICs. So avoid IP address ranges overlapping if you think to connect Azure network with uh, your on-premises network. Uh, don't leave the default settings if you want to assign static IP addresses and uh, configure at least two address spaces if you choose to set up VMs with multiple NICs. In most cases, you won't need to specify a static IP address for your virtual machine. Uh, virtual machines uh, in a virtual network will uh, automatically receive an internal IP address from a range that you specify during the initial configuration. But in certain cases, specifying a static IP address for a particular VM makes sense. For example, if your VM is going to run DNS or will be a domain controller. In our scenario, we strongly suggest you assign static IP addresses at least to the domain controllers and the SQL servers. The configuration of static IP addresses to bestow server, if you don't expose any services, is not needed. As it is written in the slide, you should always specify an availability set when creating more than one virtual machine for the same purpose. And this is because putting two or more virtual machines in availability sets guarantees that your virtual machines are spread across multiple racks in the Microsoft Azure data centers. This means uh, redundant power supply, switches, and servers. And again, grouping virtual machines that expose the same kind of service in availability sets also gives to the Windows Azure Fabric Controller the information it needs to update the host operating systems. In this way, the Fabric Controller always guarantees the availability of at least one server within the availability set. It is only with this configuration that you can achieve 99, 95% availability of the service as said before Massimo. In this scenario, you should configure three availability sets, one for domain controllers, one for SQL servers, and another one for BitStore servers. Cluster, to Nix or not to Nix, that is the question. From Windows 2008 and higher versions, failover cluster nodes with multiple NICs are no longer required. The redundancy of the network layer can be implemented in different ways, as the NIC teaming, for example. But in this sense, Azure is different again. So there aren't particular reasons why create a cluster with nodes with two NICs. Uh, a unique motivation could derive from the intention to separate the traffic generated by DataKeeper for disk replication from the one generated by BitStore services. Anyway, I think uh, we are entering uh, a theoretical field that requires insights. Uh, the current configuration that we applied uses new features of Windows 2012 uh, R2 such as the dynamic quorum or the ability to remove the votes randomly in the case the cluster is split in half. Anyway, the topic of the quorum is uh, quite extensive, but I think uh, this is not the place to go deeper. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. As we said in the previous slide, uh, 
Microsoft Azure currently does not offer any functionality in terms of uh, shared storage that makes it possible to implement a failover cluster. For this reason, we used a third-party software. It's called uh, DataKeeper and uh, is produced by SEOS company. By the way, I talked a lot with people of SEOS who are very helpful and knowledgeable, really. DataKeeper Cluster Edition allowed me to build a cluster using only local storage in a sunless configuration without any shared storage. It uses efficient block level replication to keep uh, local storage synchronized between the nodes. Uh, the installation procedure is very simple and doesn't need uh, additional nodes uh, to the documentation. It's just execute a simple setup, a typical procedure next, next, next on both nodes. Once you complete the setup and uh, import the license, you have to configure a synchronization job. Uh, job configuration is really simple. You must specify a source server, a target server, disks, uh, IP addresses to use, and the type of synchronization. Uh, synchronization can be synchronous or asynchronous. In my lab, I use the synchronous replication, less performance, but uh, more reliable. After publishing my article, some have asked me information about performance of DataKeeper. So I thought uh, it would be interesting to include uh, this slide uh, in this presentation. From the performance point of view, DataKeeper synchronous mirroring is going to add less than 20% overhead in terms of uh, write throughput. Uh, this slide shows a test run with uh, three different configurations. The first one without any replication technology, then using DataKeeper, and finally activating uh, SQL Server Always On Availability Group. Without any replication technology, the platform has performed over than 1 million inserts uh, per second. The same job with DataKeeper Sync turned on was doing over 900,000 inserts per second. In comparison, when, when they turned on always on availability group, they could only get less than 300,000 inserts per second. Uh, this is obvious if you think uh, always on availability group implements uh, a communication very intense at the application level inside the transaction. Uh, once closed the problem of shared storage, we can finally install SQL Server. Uh, the procedure for installing SQL Server 2014 does not include any action in particular. Uh, the setup of SQL Server provides some possibilities in terms of uh, cluster installation. Uh, what normally do is to run the cluster preparation on all nodes, uh, proceed with the installations of the service packs, and then run the cluster completion. Before starting this little adventure, I thought that the most complicated problem to solve was the shared disk. Uh, I was wrong. Let me say that uh, the configuration of the client access to the cluster resources has been the most difficult to solve, at least for me. I have included this slide because I think it is very important to show what happens normally in an infrastructure on premises during a failover. After the service is stopped, the active node the register its MAC address on the network switch. The cluster resources, such as uh, services, network name, and IP addresses, move on the second node. The second node registers its MAC address on the network switch, and then updates the public IP registration on the DNS. For Microsoft Azure, 
the cluster service cannot interact with the physical network layer. So it says uh, if the address of the cluster resource was recorded on all nodes at the same time from the network point of view. Uh, to make sure that the client may contact the node that has the SQL service active, you must configure an internal load balancing. Azure Internal Load Balancing provides a load balancing between virtual machines that reside inside of a, a cloud service or a virtual network with a regional scope. With an um, uh, ILB configured, Azure Network Layer checks the status of the individual port and forwards traffic only on the responding node. As I said before, during the implementation of my lab, I'd, I dedicated much time to the client access setup, and I was confronted with uh, this limit. Um, let me say that uh, on Microsoft Azure, things change quickly. But at the moment, I think, you can configure up to 150 ports per IP address. Having two nodes, you have uh, 75 ports that you can use as shown in the slide. So one for SQL Server, one for RPC, 21 ports for SSO. Uh, this is not a random number, but there is a KB article that specifies this number talking about firewall configuration. Then 44 ports dedicated to dynamic RPC communications for the distributed transaction coordinator. We will see later, speaking about test, how this actually is not a limit. Last two actions about uh, client access. You must instruct the cluster service to respond to the internal load balancing. Even for this configuration, you have to use a PowerShell script with this command, you can specify the range of ports that dynamic RPC use. You can use the config interface to restrict the range of dynamic RPC ports, and then registry editor to instruct the MSDTC to use them. This procedure that is normally used when we work with firewalls in this case, the same procedure has been applied to, the, to configure the ILB. Uh, let me say that the configuration of the service enterprise single sign-on in the cluster has never been easy, at least for me. Anyway, the article indicated on the slide describes step-by-step uh, -step what you have to do. After the installation, you need to set uh, use network name for computer name setting on the cluster resource property and make the resource dependent from an SQL Server cluster resource. The setup procedure of BitSoft nodes is pretty simple and standard, maybe a bit long, but generally standard. Also for this phase, uh, there is a very detailed document that I think everybody follow. Other good uh, references are the articles of my friend uh, Sandro Pereira, who writes excellent procedures. I don't think uh, it is any more interesting to say about the installation of BitStock. Obviously, if you have uh, any questions, don't hesitate to contact me at my mail address. OK. Well, let's start with the demo. Uh, okay. I think it's here. OK. Here OK, you thank you, Massimo. Uh, in this demo, I would like to show you how to configure a shared disk with Data Keeper. First of all, I start the failover cluster console, and let's see what is the current configuration of the disks. So expand storage disk. Right now, you can see the shared disk on which it is configured 
SQL Server. Here is the SQL Server role. The okay, all the resources, SQL Server services, network name, an SDTC, uh, SSO, and the shared disk. Before starting this demo, I prepared two volumes of uh, five gigas on both servers that I formatted NTFS and to which I signed the letter G. Then start uh, Data Keeper Management Console and let's set up a new shared disk for this cluster. The first step is to create uh, a new job create job, uh, to specify a job name, a job description, very good description, create. At this point, uh, we choose the initial source server. Uh, for initial source server, I mean the server that initially acts as a source server. Once the configuration will be completed, the source and the target will be controlled by the cluster service. So I choose the second node. Uh, here we see a very interesting thing. As I said during the presentation, if we want to separate the network traffic generated by replication with that generated by BitStore services, we have to configure a server with two NICs. And here is the point where I can choose the address for the replication process. So we choose an IP address. Obviously, I specify the drive uh, that I prepared. And then proceed uh, with the configuration. I do the same things uh, for the second node. So server name, IP address, and volume. Here, it is the form where I can choose the kind of replication. So I select synchronous. Once I confirm the configuration, Data Keeper prepares the replication job and soon will ask me if, if I want to register this unit as a cluster resource. Surely, yes. Uh, now, let's see what happened in the failover cluster manager. So, we expand disk. We have a volume G available uh, for a new or existing uh, cluster role. Uh, last thing, if you open uh, uh, Windows Explorer, you will notice that uh, the passive node cannot access the secondary disk. And this is exactly the same behavior that you would have with a shared disk. Okay, that's all. Now I pass the mic to Massimo, who will speak about the test performed and make some conclusion. Okay, okay. Um, Maybe I close yeah. the, the presentation. Oh, you really? Yes, because that's uh, not good. So show or maybe do like this. Uh, open like this and go directly to the uh, okay some test. Okay, we are back. Good, thank you, Salvatore. So um, these are the the test scenario for uh, for uh, for our lab. Okay. So to, to test uh, the, our infrastructure, <coughs> the infrastructure that uh, Salvatore described, uh, we use uh, the, the server that you can see in, uh, in this slide. So this is the minimal sizing, of course, um, to test this type, to, I mean, to set, it up this, to set up this type of lab. And uh, again, remember that we are talking about uh, a dev or uh, test environment. Don't try with four gigs, uh, one core, no way, guys, uh, you will 
you will be stuck in the mud. So this is the minimum uh, requirements to, to try it. Okay? Uh, so basically, the, the aim of uh, our test was uh, to check uh, the network layer. So we would like to check uh, whether the, the MSDTC okay, uh, can, uh, was able to handle uh, a certain number of transactions and uh, if check if whether the, the limited number of dynamic port uh, was the real uh, bottleneck for uh, this scenario. Okay, so here we create a very, very simple test scenario. We create a schema. We debatch uh, on this uh, input schema. And for uh, every single instance, we create uh, an orchestration that sends, uh, the, sorry, that uh, insert, uh, pardon, that insert uh, this uh, simple, uh, simple row in, uh, in a SQL table, okay, on a different server. And then uh, we submit uh, uh, two instances, one with 1,000 and one with 10,000 uh, transactions in it. Okay. So uh, these are uh, some, um, let's say, uh, information that we collect, uh, collected uh, uh, with our uh, test. So we can see that, uh, that the configuration on uh, the net TCP, sorry, the TCP layer with the, the limited number of ports, okay, has not created any side effect. We, you can see on the right that we generated uh, up to 500 active transactions. And uh, this uh, was the limit because uh, of uh, the bespoke uh, connection, pool, uh, connection pooling. And uh, again, uh, if you check the, the, the committed transaction or the, the trend of the, the committed transaction, it was uh, it's very limited, okay? This is basically not because of uh, the infrastructure, but uh, because of the design of the flow that we use uh, to, to implement uh, our test. This is uh, basically the, um, the test that we did, nothing more than this, uh, um, because the aim was not to check performances, but check, uh, uh, be sure that the, 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 the problem with the ports was not uh, reading a, a, a blocking problem in our uh, uh, lab. So, key uh, takeaways uh, of the session. So, does uh, this uh, installation work? Yes, it works. Okay. Is uh, this uh, um, configuration ready for production environment? No, it's not supported, as we said uh, in, uh, in the beginning. Okay. The Data Keeper by CIOS, uh, the one that uh, Salvatore showed you, is uh, officially supported uh, for building a failover cluster uh, as uh, April 1st, okay? And uh, what we here I put, uh, you, can, uh, you can find the link, uh, uh, the link of the um, official, uh, official um, let's say, um, marketing uh, um, news where they said that uh, is completely supported uh, by uh, Microsoft uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the Data Keeper is uh, the, the size offer is the only one Azure certified software uh, to bo um, in order to um, that enable, let's say, to build the Sunless failover cluster in Azure. Okay, and uh, you can also find it is available in the marketplace. Uh, okay. Um, you can find uh, here at the bottom of the slide uh, also an article uh, that refers to the Microsoft support. And uh, in this article, there is written that uh, the uh, third party um, software that enable to create uh, replicated volume resources are uh, um, supported uh, in order to build a SQL failover cluster. So um, the data keeper is supported, but is not supported when you use it um, with Bistock. So to, to make it, uh, to explain it, to try to make it uh, easier to understand, it's supported so you can uh, build your uh, solution with using a failover cluster, but when you have Bistock, it's not supported anymore, okay? Um, so again, th thanks to DataKeeper, we can uh, build uh, a failover cluster. So, and this, uh, this article is a little contradictory 
and uh, if we hope uh, that Microsoft will uh, address this uh, this oversight. Let me say in the, in the next uh, update of this article that, uh, according to me, is uh, definitely uh, definitely um, required. Okay. So uh, to to conclude uh, this uh, this session. So what's next? First, uh, um, the partners needs uh, this type of infrastructure. Okay not only for dev and test environment, but we really need it for production because our customer ask for that, okay? Uh, we know, as we said before, that the cloud is convenient and our customer want to extend their infrastructure to the cloud. So we really would like uh, to, again, uh, to push Microsoft to address this, uh, this problem uh, with a VStock, a failover cluster, or uh, to enable to set it up and uh, build uh, um, high available infrastructure on Azure. And then a few days ago, there were this tweet from Michael, San Michael Sand, I guess, and he was asking if uh, he was saying uh, that uh, probably uh, ability, always on availability group uh, would be supported uh, in uh, the 2016-2016 version of BizTalk. We really hope, okay, as uh, it's a rumor, it looks uh, like, but we don't, uh, we don't, uh, we don't have at the moment any any information about this. So we really hope that this will this thing will be next, uh, not only for uh, uh, classical on-prem uh, situation infrastructure scenario, but also in the cloud uh, for uh, for Azure. That's all, that's what we, we prepared uh, for uh, the session tonight. So we really hope uh, to have uh, some, uh, some good news uh, from uh, uh, Microsoft soon. Now we'll, uh, we will switch. Uh, I see that Salvatore is already checking the, the questions uh, over there on the, on the blog. So if you, if you have any, uh, any question, we really would like to, to have a discussion with you about that thing. Um. I have some problem to log in, but um, well, there is uh, one, uh, one question. When you, the, when you did the performance test, were you using uh, Data Keeper in sync or sync mode? Uh, I used only sync, sync mode for my environment. OK, wait, I just check. I see some question also here. Let me. Check. Did, did you check? Uh, can you please check, Salvatore, if uh, the, there are other questions? Uh, okay, normally. Can you check uh, if you have uh, other question on the web? No question. Ah, okay, guys, if there is no question, I, I forgot my last slide that is very good. As you know, <laughs> guys, you know today, no, uh, yeah, it's the Star Wars Day. Huh? So I we would like to thank you all uh, for having us uh, tonight, uh, and maybe the force will be, be with you and also with us. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Good night. Okay, there are questions. Good. Uh, we are here, guys. Tell me, Sam. Let me switch. I think we address all the questions, but okay, we will check it again. No problem. Can you... Do you see other questions, Salvatore, please? Mm, no. Can we uh, get...